This is The Future Of, where experts share their vision of the future and how their work is helping shape it for the better. Hello, I'm Amelia Searson. It's not uncommon for women to use social media platforms like Instagram to foster a culture of empowerment and motivation through carefully crafted photos. But could this be causing more harm than good? With the rise of fitspiration, hashtags and body envy, studies are starting to show it could be detrimental to women's physical and mental health. To discuss this topic with me today are two special guests. First, we have an adjunct postdoctoral fellow and cultural expert, Dr. Madison Magladry. And second, we have Professor Cecilia Thorgerson Dumani, the co-founder of Curtin's Physical Activity and Wellbeing Research Group, who is going to provide health insights into this topic. Thank you both for coming in today. You're welcome. welcome. So, Madison, can you explain the current culture sort of surrounding women's fitness on social media uh, platforms like Instagram? Yep, um, I definitely can. Um, what I've observed is, uh, I guess, some cultural themes around authenticity. Um, this idea that we need to present ourselves in a way that seems real. I think there's a really dominant narrative that social media is not real and our lives on social media are not real. Um, and in a lot of fitness cultural media, uh, specifically Instagram, which is where I focus, um, there seems to be a, a trying to be a response um, saying that, you know, this is this is me real. This is my body. Um, and you can see things like, um, uh, I guess, a move towards trying to notice the imperfections of, of the body. Um, things like, you know, this exercise isn't for everyone. Um, I, you know, I have a stomach roll here or, um, you know, if I tilt my body in this way on Instagram, you can you can see that maybe I'm perfect. Um, but if I tilt it the other way, I'll, I'll look worse or, or how people think worse looks like. Um, but it's really important to remember that um, authenticity is a set of practices. Um, it's not natural or real, which I think a lot of this um, culture does uh, emphasize. Um, but it's important uh, to realize that it, yeah, it, it isn't natural. Um, I think also that there is um, what uh, a colleague of mine, Akani Kanai, writes about as uh, a culture of spectatorial girlfriendship. Um, so she writes that girlfriendship is this kind of, um, and I'm using girlfriend in a heteronormative way, meaning two women that are friends, not um, a queer relationship. Um, the kind of uh, scripts that we see in, in terms of uh, female friendships, like um, complimenting each other and uh, supporting each other, but also you know, being critical, saying, you know, maybe you shouldn't wear that outfit, it's not really flattering. Um, and so Akani Kanai writes that online, um, this is done uh, through um, digital communities. Um, and we can see this with um, the communities that influencers, social media influencers, build around them. Um, people like Kayla Itzinis, for example, um, will uh, ask her followers um, to give their or give her um, their before and after selfies, and she compliments them on their journey. But um, this girlfriendship uh, is conditional on you know these people purchasing her product and these people making a specific kind of um, commitment to uh, perfection, even if they never reach it. Um, so there's a lot of uh, weird things going on, or maybe not, maybe weird isn't the right word, but a lot of sort of seemingly paradoxical um, cultural themes. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear all about that. It's a very diverse sort of culture and it's very complex, it, it seems. Like on face value, you wouldn't really think so, but then when you start analysing, I guess, the psychology behind it and the girlfriendship, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, Cecilia, uh, moving away, I guess, from culture for the moment and sort of looking more at the fitness side of things, um, uh, women seem to be exercising less than men in Australia. Why do you think that is? Yes, that's correct. So the evidence points towards um, very consistent trends that women across the age spectrum are less physically active than men. But when we say physically active, that's not only fitness ac activities. It can include things like walking, lifestyle activities, etc. But of course, sometimes the um, differences are greater in terms of, sort of some more structured exercise. So 
things like going to the gym, playing sports uh, that are more structured rather than lifestyle. And women do a little bit better in terms of, not than men, but compared to other domains in terms of more lifestyle type activities that they do as part of their daily life. So why is that? Um, there are a bunch of reasons and it depends on uh, which age group, which context that you actually ask those questions. So the, the barriers to young girls, for example, are very different from the, to those um, who are retiring or older adults. So, so it's not possible to sort of across the board say these are the main reasons, but some of the things we know that we can divide it into sort of individual level factors, could be attitudes, whether you believe that being physically active is gonna actually provide you with benefits and do you value that those outcomes, for example? It could be to do with people's levels of confidence of being active. Do they think they can master it? If they don't, they're unlikely to do it. Um, it could also be social, the social environment um, and your carer responsibilities, for example. So we just know that women are still the main carers of, of children. That's obviously is, is another barrier. So some of them are time and time is often noted as a, as a barrier, but probably underlies some sort of more deeper entrenched sort of attitudes as well. I think as girls grow up as well, and even girls who start playing sport, um, we know that there are a lot of barriers that go against them sort of continuing into being physically active adults. So girls, for example, who start sport as children drop out at this disproportionate rate to, to men. And that has to do with this, the, with the culture, with um, with the fact that as girls they grow up, they um, and their their bodies develop, um, they go further away from that kind of athletic ideal biologically, um, and they experience a lot of appearance concerns that will actually act as a big barrier to them continuing sort of more lifelong, uh, and men are kind of celebrated more for engaging in competition generally speaking as well. Um, so there's a whole bunch of reasons. I mean, there are other things like the environment as well. Um, is the environment conducive to being physically active? Is, it sa is your neighborhood uh, safe? Women might have a different perceptions of what is safe to what men has as well. So it's really quite complex. And I guess the bottom line is that, you know, you're likely to take part in an behavior like exercise if you consider the benefits to outweigh the number of, of costs. Um, and for, unfortunately, probably for a lot of women, it doesn't uh, for all those different kinds of reasons. Yeah, I definitely have many uh, relatives who don't, who are massive footy fans, love footy, but they don't perceive women's football to be anywhere on the same level. They don't take the time yeah. to watch it or show any interest in it so that's yeah really interesting that's right um, and I, I remember you know as a when I was a, a, a child I was really into soccer or what we call soccer here football back home and I was like literally the only girl who was playing soccer and I loved it but this social norms for a girl is like oh god you know we don't want to play against a girl and that has changed that perception I think but you really had to be super determined and I really loved it. And you know, when you love doing something, regardless of all the external constraints, that will really, that will really help you, uh, you know. Well, there was continue. that uh, female football player who was photographed with her, with her leg up and then yeah, everyone was, yeah, yeah, everyone was focusing on that rather than, than the fact she was an incredible that's right. You know, and that's the thing, actually, at the end, and that's why the body image concerns for women are so much greater than they are for, for men. And women are judged on what, how they look rather than what they can do. And men tend to be judged on what they can do. So I think, you know, it's just sort of cultural expectations that, you know, we, we grow up uh, wanting to use sort of... Um, how can I best put it? We need to conform to those societal expectations. So it becomes all about how we, how we appear rather than what we can do. And our research has also shown that in terms of motivation, you know, it's a powerful motivator to improve your appearance for women, even more so than it is for men, but it doesn't last. That's a problem. It doesn't lead to lifelong engagement. So we need to change that. We need to um, take a different approach. Definitely. And Madison, something that's, I think, mentioned quite a bit when the topic of feminism comes up is that, you know, women shouldn't be bringing other women down. 
I've definitely noticed if I see a, a woman post a photo um, at the gym, you know, wearing makeup and showing their body, some people will label it as fake and very constructed. But on the opposing side, if a woman is, you know, particularly muscular at the gym, um, I've heard people refer to them as unnatural and disgusting even. Um, what do you think needs to happen to foster a more inclusive and supportive environment on social media? There's so much happening in this question. I, I love it. Um, I think I want to address first um, this idea that women need to support other women. And, and while I absolutely agree, um, I think the onus should not be on you know the, the, the criticizing woman, but on patriarchy and the, the misogyny that we internalize and um, you know put onto other women. So it's not the saying like, hey, girls, if you want equal rights, you need to stop criticizing each other. Um, the, the enemy is still patriarchy or the system rather than the individual. Um, I think uh, it's interesting because you know this idea of a supportive fitness culture, is really complicated. Um, I think I would be, I don't know if I could suggest anything productive um, from a place where I'm critiquing what's currently going on. Um, what I do find though, is that, um, you know, this, there is definitely this practice of, um, yeah, critiquing all kinds of people, con uh, like different archetypes or different scripts of gender um, and also scripts of power, right? So, you know, these, um, a lot of women uh, that you're talking about, the mus more muscular women, are um, often celebrated in certain circles, things like CrossFit for being muscular, whereas that same circle might deride uh, a woman who only focuses on cardio, um, the cardio bunny, the cardio queen. Um, and conversely, you know, someone who might focus on, on a, uh, a more feminine or traditionally feminine look um, might uh, see muscular women as, yeah, um, masculine or, or ugly. Um, but it's important to remember as well that um, as much as it is an act of discipline to critique bodies that are not conforming to, um, yeah, pre prescripted uh, gender roles, um, complementing bodies um, for uh, for um, conforming to these scripts is also a form of discipline. Um, for example, and this is a little personal maybe, um, but uh, I know my family often comments when I've gained or when I've lost weight and they say, you look really great, like well done. They won't call me out for gaining weight. They won't say, you know, Maddie, you, you look fat. Um, thank, thank you. Um, but uh, I started to realize that, um, and, and this is not just personal anecdote, um, I started to realize that uh, I was getting this, you know, little hit of confirmation, I guess, that I'm doing something right when I'm losing weight. Um, and uh, just the same uh, on a you know social media level, saying that someone looks good at this weight makes them think, yeah, okay, I need to be this weight and this is where I'm going to get um, compliments for my body. If I lose weight, I might not get told or if I, you know, have a different body shape or type, I might not get told this is horrible, you're ugly or fat or whatever, um, but I won't get the um, the compliments that make me feel good. Um, so I think uh, an, an idea, um, one of my ideas for making it, um, making fitness culture more supportive is to go away from what people look like, what bodies look like, to what they can do. However, um, that's not a panacea, that's not a cure-all. Um, and I know that uh, saying, focusing on what a body does can also um, enter into ableist discourse where we can say that, you know, one person because of their, you know, biology, because of the way culture, position, culture and society positions their bodies to um, be, have access to, to all of the kinds of activities, um, that won't apply to, to other people. And, we need to be careful about how we measure value um, in that sense. So we really need to be interrogating the meaning of kinds of activity um, and trying to go away, I think, from uh, analyzing bodies and looks. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. So you think there needs to be more of a maybe case by case sort of navigation surrounding when you comment on someone's Instagram post and like to really reflect on the implications of 
what you're saying maybe. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's a good rule of thumb to always be critical of, of what you say, how it's going to be received, being mindful that, you know, if your intention is to pay someone a compliment and you're saying, well, I actually wanted to say something nice to you, that might not be how it's taken and that's okay. You just need to work with that. Um, yeah. And Cecilia, how do you think motivation comes into this and what main factors affect motivation do you think and what are some of the best practices in your opinion to sustain it in the long run? Yeah, big question as well. <laughs> We're doing a whole yeah. research programs on. Um, so when we think about motivation it's about the direction and the and and the the, the amount and the what, uh, the reasons why we're doing something. Um, so that's incredibly important. So it's about the direction and intensity of effort. Um, and if we have a sufficiently strong desire to do something, we'll do it. And if, as I said, if we, we can, you know, perceive more pros than cons. Um, the problem is that motivation, it's not, it's not only about how much motivation you have. The, it's the quality of your motivation that's important. Um, so a lot of the research that we're doing is looking at um, this idea that certain types of motivation are quite low quality. You can have very high levels of motivation that's of very low quality and you can have, you know, high levels of that are uh, higher quality. So for a lot of women especially, their sort of main motivation is about improving appearance, uh, wanting to lose weight, you know, not for all women of course not, but, but it's a pretty uh, big, big trend for men as well. And, and other uh, non-binary people as well. However, the problem with that type of motivation is that um, it's, it's very dependent on sort of socially sanctioned um, issues. Um, so, so we want to, so if I want to improve, you know, exercise because it improves my appearance, it's not really in my control, right? It's come, the direction comes from outside, doesn't come from within me. So I, I want to do it because I want other people to think I look good, um, not because I derive pleasure from it, for example. So when we talk about, so we talk about extrinsic and more self-determined types of motivation. So what we're trying to do in our research is we might come from a place of, yes, I want to improve my appearance or I want to lose weight, etc. But we want to get people to the point of saying, actually, I'm enjoying this. I, even I'm enjoying spending time with the people I'm doing this with. So fostering what we call sort of a sense of both competence, feeling we can master something, feeling that we have fun with it, or at least that we can identify the, the more intrinsic benefits of doing it, such as, you know, um, it would benefit my health, for example, not so much my appearance, but because I have more control. So for those sort of more high quality motivations, you have more control over. Um, and I think we've, we are so caught in that sort of trap of, I'm doing this because then people won't put me down. I won't feel ashamed of myself. Um, those don't lead to sort of um, consistent, it can lead to sort of consistent exercise behavior, but often when it becomes compulsive, um, but it doesn't lead to sort of healthy patterns of exercise behavior going forward. So we need to help people change that. Yeah, mm. and I suppose something that definitely comes into or under motivation is the concept of uh, fitness influences. Mm. So Madison, what role do fitness influences have in this whole narrative, do you think? Well, I think increasingly um, we're starting to trust influencers as a source of authority for things on um, particularly our health and well-being um, because of the you know massive influx of information that we get from every corner of the world, every media source about what is good to do. Um, so we start, instead of uh, placing or identifying authority in terms of uh, who is, you know, scientifically um, qualified, um, who has, you know, these credentials in this area, um, we tend to go more towards like emotional attachments um, or even physical attachments. You know, we find a person attractive and so we listen to them uh, or we think they're really funny or cute or they have nice dogs. Um, and this, this is similar, I think, to the way um, we might interact or with our friends, like we trust our friends for advice. Um, and 
influencers try to um, construct uh, that kind of intimacy um, that you might have with a friend, although of course it's very different. Um, so increasingly we are uh, looking to influencers for advice. Um, this is difficult to say. Influencers are constructed, right? Um, they are real people, of course, they're flesh and blood. Um, they might have, uh, you know, different, slightly different names or have changed names, but, you know, we can assume that they're real people. Um, but uh, like all texts, they are constructed. Um, they, uh, and they're constructed through visual language, um, things like the images that they post, um, the videos they post, the editing that happens. Um, you know, actual language or what we know as actual language, how they speak to you in what kind of tones, um, how they address us, the viewer. Um, and this is about fostering trust um, and uh, encouraging, I guess, that sort of intimate connection. Um, what's important to remember is that not all influencers are experts. Um, some of them are using, well, a lot of them use um, anecdotal evidence uh, to support, um, you know, things that they're giving advice on. Um, for instance, I've been doing a lot of research on uh, quarantine routines, um, both fitness and sort of wellness in general. And um, these people will, will tell you um, with all seriousness and, and probably very good intentions that, you know, um, you know, I really like to be hydrated. I find it's really useful. Um, and we find that, or, you know, I say we, it's a generalization, but we, we tend to find that more convincing to us than a doctor saying you need to be hydrated because it's going to do this and this to your body. Um, but it's this, uh, it, it, yeah, it's really important to note that, yeah, it's, it's um, maybe not the only authority. Um, and, and of course, as texts, uh, influencers provide and reinforce um, dominant narratives of femininity, of um, class, race, etc. Um, they, again, the visual language tends to be quite glamorous, um, tends to be quite aspirational. Um, you know, you, the viewer, want to be like them, um, even if they're not perfect. Um, and that is part of the charm, right? Part of the authenticity. Um, yeah, I think that's... Yeah. yeah. And off the top of your head, do yeah. you know any um, fitness influencers who are promoting a more positive culture? Uh, I do. I think this is a, also an interesting question um, because I, I, I struggle to answer it, um, to say def with definitive authority that there is a better influence, or sorry, a better influencer or a better fitness culture. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it comes down to how you define positive if you're talking about you know, more inclusive, more personalized, more authentic. These are, are all constructs. They're all sets of practices. Um, so it is, it really depends on um, like, yeah, cultural norms. Having said that, uh, ones that I find uh, useful, um, very critical about the system in which fitness uh, culture is organized, capitalism, um, colonialism, um, yeah, patriarchy, heteronormativity, Etc. Um, I like uh, decolonizing fitness on Instagram. It's at decolonizing fitness. Um, he's very um, aware of uh, d you know how different bodies, different identities are addressed and constructed through fitness culture, especially fitness media, um, and engages with sides of fitness that we don't often see. Things like how to work, um, how to how to be fit, or how to do fitness um, if you are in constant pain. Um, how to do fitness if you um, have disabilities, um, how to deal with it if you go to a fitness class and you're the only non-white person in a room, um, that kind of thing. Um, I also like Susanna Barkataki. Um, I think to call her a fitness influencer would probably be doing her a disservice. Um, she is a yoga practitioner and uh, her social media presence is dominantly about um, critiquing, uh, I guess, mainstream perceptions of yoga. Um, she talks about, uh, you know, different kinds of language used in yoga. Um, she does a whole master class on uh, critiquing the word uh, namaste, for example. Um, so I think what I define, I suppose, as, as more positive would be um, cultural influencers that are very critical of, uh, of the systems, um, not so much the individuals, but definitely the systems involved in fitness culture. Mm. That's really interesting. And that lends well into the next question that I would love both of your perspectives on. Um, 
for those who don't identify as young, white, cisgendered women, what challenges do they have within the fitness uh, within fitness culture? Um, certainly, we know that overall the physical activity levels tend to be lower, so that's obviously something going on um, about the different sort of barriers that that people might experience. And I, I guess we again we're talking about sort of a structured exercise as opposed to lifestyle physical activity that can be done, you know, anywhere, etc. Because I guess the gym environment is quite a gendered type of environment, and it can be threatening for even you know, even some men and certainly women, and if you're non-binary, I'd imagine they'd be even greater. So I think issues surrounding that would probably be a big, would be a big reason for that. Hmm. Uh, I'm also, I am non-binary, yeah. <laughs> so I can speak to my anecdotal experience a bit, and it is, um, there are a lot of barriers, um, and even um, in environments that claim to be, you know, women's only and might seem outwardly a bit safer, um, they still, uh, like, they either, you know, erase your identity, they don't acknowledge you, even um, simple things like if you're filling out the form and th there's no option um, for, for the gender um, that you uh see yourself as. Um, uh, what else? Yeah, so there are also yeah a lot of assumptions about um, what I want to look like, what non-binary people look like in general, um, what they can do. Uh, I think a lot of places that I've gone to um, do make an assumption that because I'm entering a, a women's space, even though it says it's explicitly inclusive to non-binary people, um, I don't or I, maybe I don't fall into their idea of what a non-binary person looks like, so they'll immediately treat me as a woman. Um, and this particular place tends to love rhetoric around um, uh, the body as gender. So, you know, they talk about the womb, they talk about the yoni, they talk about, um, you know, our yeah, body parts as are the, the hearts of our femininity, so to speak, um, which is really irritating as a non-binary person because that's not how I make sense of my body and uh, my gender. Um, however, I think, um, you know, the increasing uh, shift towards inclusivity, um, you know, inclusivity also means further labeling, further commodification. For example, this place that I'm talking about, um, which I won't name, uh, you know, says that the space is for women and it spells women with an X, which is supposedly a, an inclusive term to refer to trans women and non-binary people. Um, however, this is pretty much the, the, um, the start and finish of their inclusivity. Um, there's no real effort to, uh, to question some of, you know, the language they use um, and uh, even other things, just like the, the kinds of programs they run. Um, However, you know, there it is part of their brand that they are inclusive. So it's it kind of doesn't matter if they're actually welcoming um, to non-binary people or trans people. It's it seems to be enough. Um, I mean, it isn't enough, but it seems to be enough um, as a business to brand yourself as inclusive. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's sort of like a virtue signaling, tick the box. Yeah, kind of. yep, exactly. Um, you know, and and you go there and you notice that. Uh, there are, I mean, and I'm making assumptions here, but um, I, there are very few people I would say, well, actually, there's no one I would say that isn't cisgender. Um, however, that is making an assumption. Um, of course, non-binary people don't have to look a certain way, um, and I don't know that. Um, having talked to the owner, uh, I think I'm the first non-binary person that's ever given feedback um, about the way that uh, this particular place uh, addresses me and constructs me. Um, Will they take that feedback on board, do you think? They seem to, um, but only certain uh, teachers, only certain staff members, um, which is uh, a little disappointing, um, but uh, it's, it's, not, it's not my job. <laughs> no. And I think that it, it's, an, it's irritating with those kinds of places. It does seem to be um, the burden on the, the complaining person, the other, um, to ask to be catered for, um, which often means that we just leave. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's not your responsibility to educate every yeah. single person on the planet. Like, yeah, exactly. People have to and take it into their own hands. I think, and also, you know, look, talking about motivation as well. What something that motivates us is seeing others like ourselves being physically active. If you if you are a non-binary person going to the gym, you don't see anyone. Not that you can tell, yes. but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, uh, you might know if you don't see someone like yourself 
engaging in it, you're less likely to do it. Yes. So it's not it's not surprising that there's this sort of negative cycle of you know people don't do it because they don't see others that they can identify with mm. doing that. So so it's a sort of a negative cycle, isn't it? Mm. Yep, it really. And is. it's the same for for you know you talk about you know other other people you know older adults you see more and more in the gyms for example which is great we didn't used to see that so much but you see more and more of them so they kind of can tend to come in groups don't they mm. have certain sessions you know that sort of thing helps yeah i'm not saying that there should be a non-binary session as such i, I don't mind. know i would like it <laughs> yeah maybe some people will maybe others wouldn't i'm not sure yeah true. but there could be you know that there could be ways of working around it or yeah. at least if there's an option there yeah, yeah. exactly 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 um the the place that i uh, go to them talking about very covertly, um, has also floated the idea of having a workshop dedicated to women in larger bodies. Um, and yeah, some people might like that, some people might not, but I think it is about having the option. Um, but also, you know, the staff I think is important. Like it's not enough that um, the participants are the gender that, you know, are, are diverse genders, are, are diverse bodies, ages, races. Um, it's really telling when, you know, a place that markets itself as inclusive has all white, cis, uh, heteronormative, staff members, uh, you know, women um, in their staff. And I think there's also uh, differences from what I observe mm. uh, from going to the gym. You, you see, you do see gay men mm. who are quite overtly gay. Yep. And I think there's more of a culture of gay men Absolutely. actually attending gyms. And it's, it seems to be quite well accepted these days, you know. Yes. But so it's quite yeah. interesting. You, it's depending on, you know, when you talk about non-binary, it depends on sort of who you're looking at, right? True. With different groups have have different challenges, it seems, as well. So not sort of treating everyone who is, you know, non-binary yeah. or whatever uh, the same way is also important to consider. But I think that's a great idea about, you know, making it easier also for people who are non-binary to, you know, to work in these places yep. because they are role models at the end of the day, aren't they? So, yep. but, um, so I think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And obviously we, this year has been crazy. <laughs> We've had a global pandemic which continues to rage through many countries. Uh, what do you think the impact of the pandemic has been on fitness culture? I know, as you were saying, people are doing quarantine routines. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we know, I mean, from physical activity data, that those who used to be sufficiently physically active, which we can talk walking here, so mm. it's actually looked in terms of step count data, it has gone down worldwide. So there has been a reduction. For people who haven't, who, ha who aren't active, there hasn't been any change. So overall, it's gone down mm. for sure, which is interesting. It's dif slightly different when you talk about sort of the fitness culture. And then anecdotally, I was also using, you know, exercise videos yep. and various, and you're trying to sort of find your way of finding some that you actually enjoy following. And there are some that's ap that are absolutely terrible. I had to, yeah, did half of it. I was like, oh, I can't stand this woman. I've got to find another one. So it's quite interesting how people sort of navigated that environment, I think. Because even at some point, you know, when everything was closed down, even going out for a walk was a bit stressful, I found. Yeah. Maybe I'm just a bit sort of anxious no, nature, but yeah. you know, you had to go two meters around <laughs> people yeah. and stuff. So I was like, oh, I just want to be inside then doing something. But, and then actually finding that appropriate uh, role model or exercise leader was really hard, Yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, I agree. Because you are looking for not only to replace the physical aspect of activity um, in your home, you're looking to replace a social aspect. Hmm. Um, so you do have to look for, you know, someone that you you like. Um, I uh, often, I used yoga with Adrian uh, mostly hmm. when I was at home. Um, and her whole thing is, uh, addressing us as a community, right? Like all our viewers, we're not just discreet viewers uh, watching her. Um, we're her friends and we're each other's friends. We're a community in ourselves, um, except we're not really. Um, I'll never know these people, <laughs> um, but it, it, it can, you know, give some people, you know, great sense of belonging to know that other people are engaging with, you know, similar activities in similar ways. 
Um, I think overall, you know, we've seen this huge increase of mediated intimacies online, you know, not just activity, but things like eating together online, um, you know, Zoom in all its um, myriad <laughs> forms, um, ASMR, all, all kinds of things that we're using to relax and cope with stress. Um, and there are all of these new articulations of authenticity. Um, but there's this really interesting wave of acknowledging the illusion of perfection. Um, specifically, I think in quarantine, um, a lot of the people that I follow, uh, the fitness influencers said, you know, like, look, I'm not going to lie to you. This is really hard. Some days I haven't been able to do it. Um, because on the one hand, you know, we also saw this huge wave on you know, be productive, you know, quarantine is no reason to, to lose control of your life. You need to, you know, discipline yourself, keep on top of it, which is really harsh. Um, and, and a lot of us don't like it. Um, so it is comforting to hear someone say, you know, you can relax. Um, but even being told that, again, is, is a kind of discipline, <laughs> I think, um, and is a kind of I don't want to be as cynical to say promotional tactic here but again you know this intimacy and this um, authenticity is conditional yeah I think it's interesting also with the social aspect it's a it's a reason why many people engage in exercise activities is for the social benefits that it provides and may not even be about for some people about the actual exercise it's just a means of getting together with others like themselves and having fun etc and obviously that was very much challenged uh, during COVID as well, and and think and you know beyond the sort of fitness influences, you know the stories you hear, which just make you feel guilty about not doing enough, is the man in Italy who ran the marathon on oh. his seven <laughs> meter balcony. Yeah. I know. You know what are the sort of realistic expectations we're supposed to you know uh, aspire to? It's just ridiculous. Yep. Absolutely. It's important to know your limitations and, and all yeah, of that. Yeah, it's that realistic, uh, you know, expectations. And I think the other thing, you know, from a psychology point of view is that what challenged people were who were in the habit of, you know, going to the gym or whatever, go for runs and well, whatever they might uh, be doing, obviously that habit was sort of broken. So now it's going to be really hard, or for some it might not be as hard, but for a lot of people it would be hard getting back into that. So a habit infers that you're doing something without even thinking about it, you know. It's just part of your daily life and obviously that was all interrupted so that's going to make it really hard for a lot of people to get back into it as well yeah mm -hmm. and looking into the future what can all of us both those who identify as women and those who don't what can we all do to help promote a more positive women's fitness culture do you think i think my response is again you know be really critical understand the systems that fitness culture is embedded in um, understand how uh, patriarchy makes sense of bodies um, patriarchy uh, patriarchy patriarchy um, look heteronormativity post-feminism um, ableism capitalism understand how it makes sense of and uses bodies and uses value on those bodies as well um, I would uh, be really careful of judging individual actions um, of or, or practices because this is not the issue. You know, we're not saying that um, you know this person needs to do that instead of this. Um, we're or again, you know, I'm seeing the enemy if there is one uh, as the systems of power that that govern you know what we get to do and how we get judged for it. Yeah, I think I think that's very important, um, and I think that can partly also be reflected in in sort of what people do. And one of the things that we know is that if you're doing something because you identify with it, it reflects your deeper values. You know, deeper values. You know, uh, being a good person. Um, focus on the fact that you, what you can get pleasure from, rather than and you, it goes back to what you said, Maddie, about. Um, appreciating the body for what it can do rather than what it looks and understand the limitations of that but even within it's all relative right yes. so if you're in a wheelchair there's all the things that your body can do yeah absolutely um, so i think that's really important and we also another some other research that we've done recently and we've got some interesting uh, results with is about re trying to also increase your levels of self-compassion so being kind to yourself and it's a bit about also about body appreciation and appreciating what it can do but it's all about being kind to yourself, understanding that other people have similar experiences to you. You're not 
the only one who is, you know, judging yourself and just being mindful of how you judge yourself. You wouldn't judge other people the, the way, harsh way that you judge mm. yourself and just trying to think about those things. And um, and there's a campaign we did some work on with a student actually recently, which is really interesting. I don't know if you've heard of this girl, Can. Mm. It, which is in a sort of an exercise campaign. There's not much evidence behind it, but it basically uses um, images and videos of girls, often girls who are different ethnicities, different gender. I'm not sure whether they're different non-binary, actually, mm. thinking about that, I need to check that. Um, and, you know, different weights, etc., and just showing the reality of exercising, sweaty, wobbly bits, and, and sort of normalizing mm. that. But also girls and women having fun doing it and mastering different skills so I think that's the other thing is you know if you can if you learn something from an activity you're doing and it challenges you you know physically mentally whatever you're going to be more focused on that and that's going to help you keep going it, uh, as opposed to being focused on how do I measure up to other people and and you know you 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 sort of look at your improvement in relation to yourself don't think about other people think about what have you now managed to do how have you learned? How am I now, you know, better than I was? Not in terms of your appearance, but in mm. terms of what I can do, etc. So, so we found actually, sorry, going back to that campaign, that with a student project is just exposure to that campaign about three times over a few weeks actually increased uh, women's levels of self-compassion, which is quite I incredible given that it is a very sort of strong determinant of mental health, etc. So, so even just exposure to images and videos, um, that, and we did sort of very tightly controlled study. So that was really quite encouraging. So it suggests that getting exposure to more realistic images and focusing on the fun and focusing on the social aspect, etc., all those things can actually benefit. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you, Madison and Cecilia, for joining me and sharing your vast knowledge on this topic. It's been really, really interesting and eye-opening to hear your thoughts on it. Where can people go to find out more about what you both do? Um, they can follow me on Twitter at, at McGladry Madison. Um, and I'm sorry that that's confusing, <laughs> but if you type in Madison McGladry, I'll come up too. Um, I think that's pretty much it yeah or my curtain staff profile <laughs> yeah so curtain staff profile is one for me as well um, I'm also on Twitter at uh, EC Thorwison and uh, our physical activity and well-being research group has its own website as well um, Paul I think it's paulresearchgroup.com it's embarrassing I suddenly can't remember <laughs> it's easy enough to find though. <laughs> and thank you for taking the time to listen to the future of this will be our last episode for 2020. Given all that's happened this year, we want to wish you an especially safe and happy holidays and look forward to welcoming you back to our next episode in January 2021. As always, if you'd like to get in contact with us, you can send us an email at thefutureof at curtain.edu.au. And if you liked what you've heard, please subscribe and leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Bye for now. <laughs>